Uh, hi everybody, uh, the, this talk is uh, using Enclave technologies to help uh, secure secrets in a distributed world. So if you're in the wrong room, please stay. This is going to be a better talk than whatever else you want to do. Uh, my name is uh, Luis Miguel Wapaya. I'm a pr principal technologist at Wind River. Uh, my specialty is security. I've been a hacker for 44 years. I hacked my first bank when I was 14 years old. Um, I started as a phone freaker in the late 70s and then a uh, game cracker on Apple II in the early 80s, and then I progressed from there, and I basically spent a lifetime doing security-related uh, uh, things. So we're gonna set the stage for the talk. Um, we're gonna talk about Starling X, but it's more than just Starling X, it's open source in general. If you look at all different offerings all over the board, you end up have a, uh, having pro issues that um, are very common. So Starling X is often used to deploy very large-scale distributed systems, um, and these systems are often geographically dispersed, uh, and we're talking about national level and sometimes uh, international level. The other problem, um, which is, I wouldn't say new, but it's definitely becoming much more prevalent, is the fact that the endpoints that run software are physically unsecure. For many years, people design software and systems under the assumption that where they live and run is physically secure, like in a data center. But this is no longer true. I mean, if you look at 5G, for example, which is a, or telco in general, you will find servers that are effectively in a steel cabinet at the bottom of an antenna, and this one is literally in the middle of a farmer's field. And so physical security of these devices is basically non-existent. There's a, either a padlock that locks the, the, the cabinet, or there's a lock, you can pick them, you can easily open them. Some people say, oh yeah, but they're alarmed. It's like, well, if I'm in the middle of a farmer's field and the alarm goes off, I have a good 20 minutes before anything shows up. So I can do lots of bad things in 20 minutes. So that causes a bunch of problems. The first one is Starling X, and open source in general, um, it uses components that handle very sensitive information. The most predominant one you'll find is obviously TLS keys. Like you look at Kubernetes, you look at Vault, you look at anything with an API endpoint, there's a TLS key behind that, right? Uh, so, I mean, I, this is a list of a few of the things that we run in Starling X. Uh, not all of them, because there's just too many of them, um, and I couldn't be bothered to find all the icons for it, so I got lazy at some point. <laughs> um, but they all have secrets in some form or another. Um, and so you end up having too many instances where sensitive information is effectively a file on disk, and I mean a plain text file on disk. So you're gonna end up with a PEM file that has a private key inside of it on disk, or you're gonna end up with a auth token that's saved on disk, or credentials like username, password, file on disk. Um, and that's you know pretty bad. Like One of the examples I like to give is disk encryption. So anybody here ever use deencrypt with Lux? Yes, okay. So one of the things that you need is you need a passphrase. And so if you're on a system that's unattended and has to be able to reboot automatically, the challenge with that, with that is, where's your passphrase? It's gonna be a file on disk in plain text. Well, that's kind of crappy because now I can just unlock your encrypted disk because you gave me the information that I need. Um, by the way, a side note, uh, disk encryption is only good against physical attacks. It's not good against insider attacks or code injection attacks. Other compo uh, components that implement storage encryption, for example, Vault. Anybody here use Vault? Right, to unlock your Vault, what do you need? Yeah, you need some form of credentials. Well, if you're on an unattended system, guess where those credentials are? They're on plain text in a file somewhere, right? And so um, you end up having Roots of trust that end up being in plain text. So even though you might have a layer of systems that like, oh, you know, my key is encrypted inside the inside a file. Yeah, it's encrypted by what? Oh, it's encrypted by the system over here. And it, that, what's the root of trust for that? Well, oh, that's a root of it's a plain text file on disk. So that ends up being a pretty big problem, especially in very large scale ecosystems where you just have tens of thousands of nodes everywhere. If you're able to compromise one node and steal a bit of information out of that you can now use that as a trampoline to effectively start attacking other nodes in the system. So we end up in a situation where sensitive information is either in the clear on disk, as is, or is protected by a series of mechanisms that eventually end up being plain, less on, uh, plain text on disk. And it's basically turtles all the way down. So there's more. <laughs> uh, 
Um, too many deployments, and we're going to talk about TLS keys a little bit here. Too many deployments fail to use TLS best practices. I don't know if anybody's aware of what they are, but one of them is you should never use a long-lived TLS key directly, right? So if your key is like this thing lasts one year, but I use it directly, you're doing it wrong. Um, uh, TLS keys, optimally speaking, should be ephemeral in nature. So when your service pops up, it should generate a key pair. It should sign the certificate for it. It should use that. Um, and it should last for a very small period of time. You know, good, well-secured services out there will actually have TLS keys that last 10 minutes, maybe 30 minutes, and then they just rotate continuously. And the reason why you do this is because you have to work on the premise that your environment will get compromised at some point. And when they do compromise, all these services, the private keys are in memory in a piece of software. Kubernetes, Vault, whatever, the, plain, the private key that is behind that certificate is in memory. So if I can compromise your environment and read memory, I can steal your key, right? So if your key lasts 10 minutes, and my attacks take five minutes to do, and then using that key to attack something else takes me another five minutes, by the time I get there, the key has expired. So you want to reduce the window of usability when it comes to uh, see people uh, stealing your TLS keys. The other pe thing that people do is self-signed TLS keys. How many people here have made services that use self-signed TLS keys? Raise your hands. Don't be afraid. It should be most of you, by the way. Some of you, yeah, there you go. Um, TLS, self-signed TLS keys are absolutely useless unless you use certificate pinning. But the problem with certificate pinning is nobody actually does it securely correctly. So yeah, you do certificate pinning, but the way you distribute your certificates is completely unsecure. And if I'm a man in the middle, boy, am I going to have fun with that, right? Um, there's no revocation capabilities with certificate pinning. Uh, and also, it's always long-lived keys. So you can't rotate keys every 30 minutes if you use certificate pinning unless you have the most amazing certificate pinning system on the planet, right? Uh, most TLS keys in open source end up being files on disk, right? Uh, so if anybody compromises your environment and is able to just read a file, they can just steal your key. And that's not a good spot to be in if you have long-lived keys, right? Uh, and as I said before, many of them are just plain text, or they're protected by roots of trust that themselves are plain text. So people say, well, I use Vault. It's like, and, and how is Vault protected? Uh, just follow on disk over here. It's like, oh, well, it's turtles all the way down. Um, so this is very low assurance, as particularly for endpoints that are physically unsecure. So there's servers out there. The servers that are in these telecommunication towers, they're like Dell servers, like regular off-the-shelf stuff. And they have these handy-dandy hop swappable disks. Right? So one of the attacks I've seen is the person breaks into the cabinet, the alarm goes off, they pop out the disk, they put it in a disk duplicator, two minutes later they put it, pop it back in, close the cabinet, put the pack log on, and bugger off. So somebody shows up at the tower going, well, the alarm went off, and there's no signs of tampering anywhere, and they go, oh, it's a false positive. So now they're completely unaware that sensitive information grew legs. And detecting that a TLS key has been stolen is near impossible. And that's the thing that's insidious. After somebody steals your, a private key for one of your TLS certificates, how do you know? You can't really detect it very easily, right? Uh, so they're also very susceptible to insider threats. So 75% of data leakage in the industry today is because of someone that you're paying, right? So either they're idiots, which happens uh, often, um, or they're malicious, they got paid. And that also happens. Believe me, it actually really does happen. Um, and obviously, very susceptible to host compromise. So there's a, lot, a whole bunch of other sensitive information that falls basically under the same problem umbrella. So, um, oh, okay, that didn't click quite well. What are we trying to solve? So what we're trying to solve is we want to use confidential techniques, confidential computing techniques, uh, more specifically, hardware-mediated enclaves, which means your root of trust is rooted in a hardware device. It's not software. Um, in order to increase resistance. Now, I say increase resistance because if there's anybody out there that think that hardware-mediated enclaves is like foolproof, boy, I have some really bad news for you. Um, and so it's all about increasing resistance to a level where you feel relatively safe, right? 
So we want to protect against physical attacks. So if somebody shows up, pops open a disc, dupes it, runs away, um, you're good, right? Insider attacks against if somebody's an idiot or if somebody's maliciously trying to steal your stuff, we want to protect against that. And code injection attacks, they still happen. They're less frequent, so I'm very happy about that, by the way. Congratulations, everyone. But they still do happen, um, and they're very hard to detect, by the way. So the goal is to significantly increase assurance behind the root of trust guarding secrets within an unattended system that runs in a physically unsecure location. And that's what we're trying to achieve. So how do we do it? Well, for the purposes of this study, and I, I've actually been doing this for a very long time, but for this particular study, we ended up using Intel XGX as a hardware media enclave. Now, I'm not an Intel XGX commercial. That's not my job. Um, but Intel chips are very widely used in industry. So, you know, if you look at the telco industry right now, a lot of the 5G towers everywhere, it's just Intel chips everywhere. Uh, Open RAN, there's just lots of Intel chips everywhere. Um, all things considered, for this use case that I'm going to talk about, Intel XGX actually does provide the best assurance level the possible. There are other options. There's AMD SCV SNP. It, that's actually a really cool option if you're trying to protect against threat vectors which stem from site channel attacks. So you, if you have a payload in a multi-tenant environment that is confidential, but you want to protect against the hypervisor admin or hypervisor compromise or another tenant in a side, a, a payload on the side, then AMD SCV SMP is actually a really good solution. It's very easy to deploy compared to Intel XGX. Um, but in our use case, when it comes to protecting secrets at rest that are the roots of trust of a chain of secrets after that, AMD SCV SMP unfortunately does not give us the mechanisms that we need. And in this case, what we're mi missing is a data sealing facility. And we're going to talk about that in a few seconds. Whoops, that's not what I want to do. Um, there's ARM Trust Zone. Anybody ever use ARM Trust Zone here? Absolutely. One per two. Oh, wow, that's shocking. Wow. Okay. Um, most people don't use it. It's a glorified hypervisor. It's just an isolation layer between um, all the payloads in an operating environment and one program. Uh, the problem with ARM Trust Zone is there's no data ceiling facilities and there's no cryptographic facilities. Like AMD SCV SMP encrypts the entire VM in memory, right? So even if you do like a Cambridge cold boot attack, you're, you're screwed. You can't steal what's in the VM. But with Trust Zone, if you actually did that, you actually can steal what's inside the Trust Zone. Uh, Intel Quick Assist, anybody ever heard of Qu Intel Quick Assist? Uh, that's actually a really cool thing. Now, usually they come in as PCI cards, so it's extra dollars. However, Intel is coming out with Sapphire Rapids, which is a really cool chip that has a CPU and a bunch of accelerators on the same die, and one of them is Quick Assist, so that's really, really cool stuff. Uh, I'm looking forward to it. And then there's TPM chips. Anybody here t use TPM? A couple of people use TPM. Uh, they're pretty useful, but they're not very widely used. Uh, they're a bit onerous to manage, especially when it comes to if you're trying to lock a key to a process and then you upgrade that process, you can no longer use the key. And so management of the keys inside TPM chip is a, a nightmare. And then imagine if you have 10,000 nodes, it's a nightmare amplified, uh, which is why for this particular thing, TPM um, is a little bit on the backseat of things being considered. Um, so the solution proposed therein could be converted to run on other technologies, but for the most part, Intel XGX seems to be uh, the hardware mediated enclave that uh, gives us the best potential. So what is Intel XGX? For those that haven't heard about this, um, basically Intel XGX is a way to protect a part of a program, uh, which is basically a .so file. It's a shared library that you load in memory, but it's loaded in encrypted memory in a way that nothing else in the system can look into that thing. Like you could be rude god controller of the high, uh, of of kernel in that machine, you still can't read what's in the payload, and that's both code and data. The other thing that Intel XGX offers is you can only only load digitally signed enclaves. And so, if anybody tries to tamper with the enclave in order to try to compromise it, they effectively blow the enclave. Like it can't be loaded anymore. It's it's basically tamper proof. Um, the in-memory in -memory runtime is encrypted. Um, 
and very high resistance against insiders. So if you're an insider and you're trying to debug the program, you actually cannot debug an Intel XGX Enclave, no matter how high your privilege level uh, can be. Um, very high resist, uh, resistance against compromised kernel. So one of the cool things about Intel XGX is it can't be used at the kernel level, and it can't be looked at at the kernel level. Uh, well, not easily. So again, like I said, there's nothing perfect. Intel XGX does have exploits against it, but they're very difficult to do, and the attack complexity behind them is relatively high. Um, Intel XGX only protects part of the executables. We talked about that. It's a shared library. We talked about it. I'm just going to skip this here. There we go. Um, the other thing that Intel XGX offers, which I think is the coolest feature which helps solve the problem at hand, is data sealing. Does anybody know what data sealing is? Nobody? Okay. So what happens is when your code inside the enclave, you can use an instruction says that says seal this piece of data with a cryptographic key. You don't have to provide the key. The key is generated based on the signature of the signature of the enclave mixed in with secret material that's inside the CPU that's been lasered in at manufacturing time that's unique to that CPU, uh, plus some other stuff that I'm not going to get into, but it generates an AES key. And basically, if you encrypt, if you seal data inside an enclave, the only place in the world to unseal it is inside the same enclave on the same CPU. So if somebody steals an uh, encrypted file that's been data sealed by Intel XGX and they go somewhere else, there's absolutely nothing in the world they can do to recover that data. People go like, ah, it's like in the movies, they're just going to crack the cryptographic key. I'm like, yes, in one septillion year, they'll probably pull it off. Um, so. It's actually really good, and the reason why it's really good is if you persist secrets on disk at rest, you can seal them so that they can only be loaded inside Intel XGX when the system starts up. On the same system? On the same system only. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So it's pinning to the hardware. Oh, it's pinning to the hardware. You, you can't get around that, which is really good. Uh, as a result, Intel XGX is actually incredibly good against physical attacks in terms that if somebody duplicates your hard disks and runs away with it, there's nothing in the world they can do to compromise that. It's very good against insider attacks. Now, if your uh, insider is an incredibly sophisticated attacker that knows about how to exploit Intel XGX and they have a lot of time on their hands, they could eventually get to the point where they can uh, gleam or derive or deduct what a cryptographic key is memory unless you use very good cryptographic libraries that have protections against timing attack and that kind of stuff, in which case they're in trouble. Um, and root privilege users on the system, they can't bypass the protection that XGX does. They actually can't turn it off. So use Intel XGX and data sealing to guard roots of trust is what we're doing. We're going to resist physical attacks, resist in insider attacks, and resist code injection attacks. Let's talk about some examples. I have 11 minutes. Oh. OK. We're going to talk about Cert Manager. Who here uses Cert Manager? Ah, excellent, excellent. Cert Manager is actually really cool. I like it. Uh, the only problem with Cert Manager is the root of trust is plain text. But there's a way to change that. So anybody here ever developed their own local issuer for Cert Manager? No? So Cert Manager has a facility where when you generate keys, you can actually ask Cert Manager to sign them for you, and it will do so using a local issuer. So instead of you having to create a certificate signing request, walking off to DigiCert, having DigiCert signing and coming back and inserting the key back in, Cert Manager will just do it locally on the computer using a local issuer. What you can do is you can develop a local issuer that uses the Intel XGX crypto key library. And that's basically a PKCS11 cryptographic module, which means you can actually save tokens, long-lived tokens, inside the library and they're going to be data sealed on that machine, and they're only usable inside the XGX enclave ever. So your root of trust is always encrypted no matter what, right? which is really cool. And you can also put attributes. I don't know if anybody ever used PKS11 before, but you can put attributes to basically make sure that the key is not extractable and a whole bunch of really cool stuff. Um, XGX library effectively drives the PKS11 engine. It all happens in encrypted memory. Uh, the other thing is the Intel XGX crypto key library has resistance to timing attacks. 
uh, and other side channel attacks like electromagnetic emissions. So there's actually really cool stuff you can do to try to own things. Now, this kind of stuff, you're, you're getting to the point where you actually have to steal the whole server and, and run away with it. Not the best idea in the world for people trying to surreptitiously compromise an enterprise. Um, we can use this trick to create a local sub-CA. So effectively, your cert manager becomes a local sub-CA that can sign TLS keys that are ephemeral in nature. So Kubernetes can start up with no keys and go like, I need keys. And like, okay, right, let's create keys. Oh, cert manager's my guy. Okay, cert manager, create me some keys and sign everything. Thank you very much. Um, and it signs them and it keeps them locally. Everything is local, so it's not like you're using networking to do anything. Uh, and each node in a, in a tree of nodes, so if you look at Starling X, you have like controllers and then you have worker nodes and you can have a hierarchy of nodes that go all over the place. All you need is your local node, the first time it starts up, will generate a root key, so one single key pair and generate one CSR. And then you have to give that CSR to the parent node. And the parent node will use its cert manager to sign it and give it right back to you. And that's the only network activity that will ever happen. But you end up in a position where if you follow all the way up the chain to the original controller, the original controller is the only one where you generate a CSR and you have to go to DigiCert and have it signed by DigiCert. But now what happens is everything in your ecosystem is effectively signed by public root CA. So you don't have to distribute certificates saying like, trust this. The public root CA is every operating system on the planet already has a trusted library of these available the second you install them. They're instantly verifiable. Um, so it makes distribution of certificates and verification of certificates uh, qu quite trivial. But it's, uh, there's no chain in Metaphor, right? You end up having a cert chain that's uh, four levels deep about. Yeah, yeah, yeah it's, it's, it's better than the alternative, right? So yeah, when you verify a cert, sometimes it can get expensive because you have to verify we do an asymmetric encryption for each level inside the cert. Uh, but with acceleration today that exists in, in modern chips, yeah, one tenth of a second maybe. Actually, if you use ECC, it's even faster because ECC verification as opposed to RSA verification is like blinding fast. Which is, uh, by the way, you should really use ECC key if you use TLS uh, because of that. Because the clients, and not only that, but it's not the server that does the cryptography, it's the client that does the cryptography. The server just says, here's my cert, right? Does that answer your question? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, okay, well, excellent. Yeah, yeah. Um, cert manager can now rotate keys all the time, right? Now, I say this with a caveat, uh, Kubernetes and a lot of software out there, and we're gonna talk about that when I, I conclude. Open source software today, one of the things that it doesn't do is it, does, it doesn't do key rotation very well. Kubernetes, for example, does not do it whatsoever unless you bring down your entire cluster, delete the keys, and restart your entire cluster, right? Um, and so I think the open source community needs to start considering the concept of I need to rotate my TLS keys as the program is running. And it's not that difficult. It, I mean, you know, one second you're accepting one TLS connection, whoop, rotate my key. The next second you accept another TLS connection. It's not complicated, right? Um, because of that, there's no certificate pinning required anywhere, which is really good because today with uh, Starling S, there is. Uh, and we are able to use publicly available certification revocation. So if, if something does happen, if somebody physically steals your server and you go like, well, damn, okay, I'm gonna take the key that was in there and I'm just gonna add it to the, the revocation chain and that's it. Automatically, um, you uh, take advantage of automatic revocation. So for disk encryption, we did something cute. We actually, and I actually ended up, when I say we, I mean me, by the way. Uh, um, we ended up doing a program that is started the second the operating system starts up, and that, what that program does is it loads the XGX enclave that recovers the passphrase, right? Now, at some point, the passphrase does in fact get passed in clear text to the Lux file system, and there's nothing you can do about that, but at no point in time is your passphrase a plain text file on disk, right? Um, I'm gonna have to accelerate. Um, so we basically protect the passphrase in memory. Uh, the program is called during bootstrap. I'm gonna skip that. Uh, for HashiCorp world, you can use the same thing. 
the credentials that are used to initiate the vault, you can protect them inside Intel XGX. Uh, and you can use the same uh, met methodology for ba basically anything that requires a root of trust to initialize it. But it's not good enough. Intel XGX by itself has a problem, which is it can't verify the validity, the validity of the host program, which means anybody can run that Intel XGX enclave. So how do you prevent that from, any, uh, from happening? Right? So if I'm a local user or a, a malicious insider, and I want to recover the passphrase for that dmcrypt drive, I can just call the enclave, and it'll just give it to me. Like, here, here it is. I was like, oh, that's very nice. Um, and so as a result of that, we end up in a situation where, um, I'm going to skip that, recover the passphrase. Yeah. I'm going to go to the next one. As a result of that, we end up in a situation where we need to restrict who can load the Intel XGX library. And we're going to use, basic, or I should say more precisely, what can load the Intel XGX library. We're going to use AppArmor. So AppArmor, one of the things that you can do with it, which is really cool, is you can say, that program over here is allowed to use, read this file over here, but nobody else can do it. So you can literally say, that .so file over here, which happens to be an Intel XGX enclave, um, is effectively only readable by this program over here, and nobody else in the system can do it. So if you're a malicious insider and you show up and you say, like, I'm going to just randomly try to load this Intel XGX enclave, they can't pull it off. Only that one program can do it. Um, so it basically prevents unintended use of the .so libraries by uh, programs that are not supposed to read it. And that's one of the ways that you can, and kernel level co components, I'm adding that, they actually can't load Intel XGX whatsoever. So people, uh, I told that in a previous talk when somebody said, well, if I'm kernel, I'm not subject to app armor. It's like, yeah, but if you're kernel, you also can't load an Intel XGX enclave. Uh, so when, what's next? So what are we doing? So there's a prototype in the works. We're gonna add it to Starling X, uh, hopefully in the future. Um, and we are implementing a local issuer that uses uh, uh, Intel XGX, or more specifically, we're adding the I Intel crypto key library XGX um, into a custom issuer that Cert Manager will use. And we're gonna also create a mechanism that allows you to automatically, once you generate your root key, have it signed by the node right above it. And so you can create automatically create certificate chains. Um, we're gonna, yeah, I already said that. Um, we're going to implement disk encryption. Now, we're not going to do full disk encryption because there's a real performance impact for the real, uh, uh, full disk encryption. So what we want to do is we want to create a bunch of small volumes that are encrypted. And then wherever you have sensitive files on the system, you just use sim links and put the file inside the virtual uh, drive. And then each virtual volume, you can give it different access rights. So or you can load them and then unload them when you no longer need them, which is actually one of the th cool things that you can do with that. So we're going to add this to uh, for disk encryption. And then future work is basically going to uh, focus on looking at ways to implement protection for things like Vault or things like Ceph or things like Postgres or whatever. It's all the same trick, right? It's an Intel. It's a very small library. It's all the same trick, so it's easy to just reuse an open source version of, you know, the 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 Intel XG, XGX library that I use for that, that I'll publish for um, the disk encryption stuff to just say now nah, I'm going to just reuse that for Vault or I'm going to reuse that for insert other open source component here. Uh, conclusion: We need to significantly upgrade the assurance level of different routes of trust inside our systems. You have to work on the premise that your system is physically unsecure. It's being used by actors that sometimes can't be trusted or, or are incompetent in nature. Um, and as a result, the sensitive information is at risk, right? Um, the other thing is we need to become better at using TLS. Today, TLS is just people are not doing it correctly. Long lived keys everywhere, um, self signed certificates everywhere. Some of them don't even use certificate pinning, so I don't really know why they use that to start with. Um, <laughs> very frequent rotation. And I do mean very frequent rotation. This is the key to success. You have to take for granted that there will be a system compromise. Um, and you have to take for granted that somebody could steal a TLS key that's used by Kubernetes or something else in memory. Well, if that key is very short-lived, their window of opportunity is, is very small. They can't do much with it, right? 
Um, no self-signed certificates, and then community needs to approach open source components such as Kubernetes. So, oh my God, I've been stopped. Um, we need to start implementing better things with Kubernetes where Kubernetes can in fact rotate keys in memory instead of having to bring down the entire cluster. And that's the end of my talk. Ah, couple of minutes off, but anyways, any questions? Yes. Uh, I have so many. Uh, oh, we can take it outside if you want. That's probably a good idea. Okay, that's awesome. Anybody else? Yeah. Yes. Yeah, you mentioned that you are about to implement your own uh, certificate issuer as part of uh, Set Manager. Yeah. Uh, I believe there is a, also Intel own implementation of Zapti certificate issuer on, on GitHub. Oh, there is? Oh, I'm going to talk to you after that. I'd like to have a copy <laughs> of that. I'm just going to steal that. <laughs> I, I didn't know it existed, so that's news to me. That's great. Anything else? Yeah. Cloud Platform is usually, at least that's what I've seen it done, it, it's opt in. You choose to have an app on the profile. In your system, is, is every, every process automatically have an app on the profile? I'm just curious how you restrict access to the whole thing. Uh, with App Armor. Oh yeah, okay. I see. I see what you mean. Well, you have to get a, bit, a, a little bit sophisticated about what you're doing. So you can't have a multi-tenant environment that is able to read all the files. Uh, you know, in Starling X, usually you have sysadmin, for example. So you have a restricted number of users. Um, so you have to do good user management. You can't just say like, "Hey, everybody, just create your own stuff." Um, yeah. Anybody else? If you have any more questions, I'm going to get out of the way for the next guy, but I'll be outside if you want to ask me questions. And I need that link from you. Thank you very much.